So the next program is a panel discussion titled Connecting the Dots. The panel is facilitated by Sumana Murali. A quick introduction to Sumana. Sumana was among the early batch of students who joined the Sri Sathya Sai Primary School in Prashanti Nilayam when it was inaugurated in 1980. Sumana completed her bachelor's degree in English in 1991 from Sathya Sai University's Anantapur campus. She later acquired her master's and MPhil in English from Chennai. Following her, and following her marriage, Sumana moved to New Jersey, where she earned an MA in early childhood and elementary education. She worked as a pre-kindergarten teacher in New Jersey and has been closely associated with the Sathya Sai Baba Center of East Brunswick, where she taught SSC for 12 years and served as the center's education coordinator. Sumana comes from a family that is deeply committed to Bhagwan and his teachings. She was named by him and guided through every avenue of her life. Sumana is an excellent baker and she makes awesome chocolate fudge. <laughs> Sumana, I'm not going to Dallas. I'm coming to your house after this. <laughs> so, Sumana, everyone. Offering my loving salutations at dear Swami's little sweet. Saram, everyone. Saram. I've been sitting up here for the last two days and I just didn't realize how many of you are back there. And it's beautiful to see both sides filled with women. Mm. The back of my head tells me the men are in the other room, but they're not. <laughs> <laughs> it's just us. So, I have this opportunity to be part of this panel that um, includes Gita Ramanti. <laughs> Dr. Saumya Panchanathan. and Niyanta Gopal. So this panel is entitled Connecting the Dots. Um, when I was called asking to moderate this panel and I was given this title, I had to do a lot of connecting the dots. But as soon as I knew who the panelists were, the job became really easy. You know, as women, we have so many different roles that we play in our lives. Some of them consciously and some of them unconsciously. We've been placed in different homes. We grew up differently. We have grown up in different cities, but there's something that connects all of us. And the fact is that we are women. We have a lot of hats that we wear. So I want you to pretend that you have a hat next to you. And if you wear that hat, pick it up and place it on your head. I am a mother. That's all is the <laughs> I am a sister. I am a daughter. I am an employer. I'm an employee. I'm a wife. I'm a teacher. I'm an author. Nice. I'm a doctor. I'm a chauffeur. So many hats. I'm a cook. Yes. I'm a baker. 
So, with all these hats, and if you have anything, any others, please put them all on. Right. With all these hats, we have so many different roles to play, and we try to do it all in 24 hours. Or we try to do our best, and we have a lot of questions about a lot of these roles that we play. Some of them we have a chance to chat with our friends, and some we try to catch up at the center, but we have questions. So it gives me great pleasure to be part of this panel to get some sort of a discussion going with these awesome ladies here. Now, I do want to say that just like the rest of us, these ladies have grown up in completely different circumstances. They are so filled with insight and wisdom. But as I was talking to them, I realized that's the way they decided to take an approach in their life and a lot of it with Swami's guidance. So as you listen to this panel discussion, you might take away a lot of things and you will take away a lot of things. Take it in, absorb, think about it, think about your own life and how you could or apply it in your life or modify it for application in your life. So, our first panelist is from St. Louis in Kansas City. She's extremely creative, she's an awesome cook, an incredible dancer and somebody who loves to eat chocolate chip pancakes for all the meals. <laughs> she's an SSC student. Um, she grew up and she was part of the center. Extremely active young adult and she's played a role at the regional level and she plays a role in the transition team that helps group fours become part of the young adults. And um, she's taken the Sathisai Leadership Program. By profession, she's an architect that designs hospital spaces. So please join me in welcoming Nianta Gopal. Our second panelist is from Canada and America. She loves to hike every weekend, and she bicycles with her dad. She's not that great at texting, but she's learning to. <laughs> Born and brought up in Canada, Ontario. She came to Swami and served as the center's devotion and SSC coordinator. She's also served as a young adult advisor. She's a practicing pediatrician and an Associate Program Director in the Phoenix Children's Hospital's Pediatric Residency Program, and an Associate Fellowship Director of Clinical Informatics at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, Phoenix. Um, she is the founding medical director of a student-run interprofessional free clinic for homeless people, and she's the mother of two grown children and a mother-in-law. Welcoming Samia Panchanathan. So now that I introduced you, you know who the third one is. Our third panelist is Gita Ram. And we all know Gita Aunty as the little girl who played chutes and ladders with Swami who grew up right under his nose, has been part of the SSC program right from its inception. And we all know that Swami has just been such an integral part of her life in every which way. She is a teacher. She taught kindergarten for over 17 years. And her, besides teaching, her best skill even voted by Swami, is speaking to everybody. She gives talks all over the world about Swami. Join me in welcoming Mrs. Gita So, we have these three 
um, ladies and um, think about it for a second. Gitanti was born and brought up in India and then she's been here for over 30 years, raised her children here. You have Dr. Samya Panchanathan who was born and brought up in Canada and then she moved here. She has born and she's raised her children in the Sai fold. Then you have Niyanta Gopal who's a young adult who grew up in a different generation. So I want you to keep that in the back of your mind because a lot of choices we make in our lives are made because of where we come from and how we are conditioned to think. And um, what we decided to do was to think of a woman's life. Think of our lives. We're born, we grow up into young women, then we take up, we go to work, we get married, we have children, we become grandmothers, and we have grandchildren, and those children grow up, and it starts all over again. So we thought to make it a little more cohesive, uh, we would have questions asked in all of these different stages in life. As a young adult, as a working woman, as a mother, as a grandmother, mother-in-law. So we'll, what I'll do is I'll cycle through these questions and um, we'll have an opportunity to hear them. So let's get started. I'm going to take the seat because I think they're recording, so I'm going to be standing all the time. So, let's start with the young adult question. So all of you have known Swami from a very young age. Could you share with us the role Swami played in your younger years? And what kind of a relationship did you have with him? And I'll start with the end up. So, growing up, Swami in my, in my relationship was routine. It was going to SSE every Sunday, going to budgets every Friday. Without fail, any weekend there was a Kunda budget or Baba's birthday, we would be at the center. Um, it was routine and it laid a foundation, but there wasn't really you know, anything extra. It was just kind of going with the flow. Um, it was our life and we loved it. Um, but that relationship, I think, takes time to develop. Um, that one-on-one -on -one relationship. And that happened later in life, I think, moving into becoming a young adult and having life situations occur that you start to develop that one-on-one -on -one relationship with him. But uh, the foundation was laid at a young age. So it's interesting. So I understand that you grew up in Swami's fold, but your relationship with him developed after your inner relationship with him. Yeah, and so, um, that relationship took some time, so becoming a young adult was um, kind of trying to find your place in the organization, what you should be doing, what you want to be doing. There was always nudges to become part of this group or join that group, and I had trouble saying no. So I, I joined and tried to find my place, um, thinking that that would give me that relationship. Um, but really where it comes is that something has to happen in your life that gets you there. And for me, it happened to be loss, where uh, losing people very close to me, I knew that the only place I could find comfort and answers was with Swami. And then living on my own also was that same situation as knowing that Swami was the only person that I could talk to and turn to, and he was always there for me. And that's when I started to develop that. It took time, but because the foundation was there, I knew exactly where to go. Thank you, Mia. Sairam. Um, so, our family came to Swami because my parents were worried that I was becoming quite rebellious. I was 12. Um, so, they actually looked around to see where they could take me, um, and they found the Sai Center. Um, so, I attended um, SSE at that time, and Actually, my first feeling after I 
moved away from home was, Swami, why did you have to come into my life so early? Because you have set a bar for our behavior that's way too high, and if I just didn't know you, that would be so much easier. <laughs> so, I have to say that my relationship actually developed when Swami scolded me on one of our trips to India. He called us in for a few interviews where everybody would think, oh wow, look at how lucky they are, and then he would scold us. <laughs> and every time I'd be like, no, no, not today, not today. And the thing is, what he was scolding me about was probably 90% in my head, maybe 10% outside. And the point was, is that he had discovered the trend. We don't just wake up one day and say, I'm not going to believe in Swami or I'm not going to follow Swami. We make a thousand decisions over time that either take us towards Swami or away from Swami. And he had, he was alerting me to that trend. And I think that day I thought, oh my God, I have made, I have disappointed him so much. And he said, you may not get remarks, sorry, you may not get marks, but don't get remarks. And I know he has said that publicly, but he said that to me. And after that, my entire goal was to never make anybody say, that person who is a Sai devotee, behaved in such and such a way. So my goal became that I should protect his name because I loved him so much. And I think that is how my own relationship with Swami developed. Thank you. Gita Oti. Sai Ram, good morning. Good morning. Mine was very different uh, from these two young ladies here. I opened my eyes, I guess I was born, and they took me to Puttaparthi to introduce me to Swami. So I completely grew up under um, the umbrella of his eyes. So um, as a child, I grew up just loving him because he used to come and stay with us. And I really thought he was like a mobile candy store. So if we kept quiet while he gave his talks to the family members, at the end of his talk, he would materialize whatever chocolate we wanted. So I think I spent uh, the early childhood part till I was three or four thinking that if I'm just quiet, he's going to give me Cadbury's chocolate or whatever it was. So I really thought it was a candy store for a long time. And then I think um, when I was about eight, uh, you've heard me before, uh, to go very quickly, an old aunt uh, who had stayed with us, who was an ardent devotee of Swami. She had come from Puttaparthi for an eye surgery and she did not want to be treated by the doctors unless she had some vibhuti from Swami, which she had run out of. In those days, uh, in the early 60s, late 50s, it was very difficult to go to Parthi and I was eight years old. My dad said he couldn't take her all the way back to Puttaparthi just for the vibhuti. Swami had sent her for uh, the surgery and the phone call came home and I happened to pick up the call and it was Swami calling from Bukapatnam, which was away from Bharti, just to answer this elderly lady's call and from the telephone a gush of vibhuti came onto the newspaper that he asked me to put under the telephone. So the vibhuti came out and I was the one who was on the phone. And I picked up the phone and he said, did you get it? <laughs> so I said, yes, there's a lot of vibhuti here. We know that Bangalore telephone is not that efficient, <laughs> but it had worked this time. And he said, you give it to the old lady. And it was a wonderful, I was the heroine of the drama for a few weeks. Everybody in the family came and I had to keep repeating the story <laughs> over and over again. And I had the center stage of all the elders to whom I kept explaining what had happened and once all of that died down, I suddenly started to think about it. I was eight years old, I was not a baby anymore and I thought, wow, if somebody loves him this much and if somebody is, has this much faith on him, 
he's even going to come through the telephone. <laughs> and that kind of changed my perception of him from this lovely, wonderful uncle who gave me candies at home to this wonderful person who responds to love and devotion. And that kind of changed it. But still, I was a part of a family that spent every single holiday, every single festival in Parthi. And it was only in my teenage years, when I was about 13 or 14, that I developed an intense sort of a personal relationship with him when he asked me to become a Balavika's guru at the age of 14. And my only resource at that time were all of the discourses and stories that I heard, had heard from him directly. There was no curriculum, there was no lesson plans or anything. So every time I had to do a class, I would go to Vrindavan. Swami used to spend a lot of time in Vrindavan because the college was being set up. And he would sit with me and help me plan my lessons for my SSC class. So I made a whole lot of lessons with his help and at that point, I realized that he could be my mother, father, he could be this divine being, but he could be my friend who was always there to help me. And from there, my relationship developed to everything. There's a lot of challenges that uh, we face, and we don't necessarily know how to talk about it. Sometimes we're surrounded by peers um, that might not have the same Psy upbringing. So you need somewhere where you can talk through that with. and. You know, we have young adult friends, but some, sometimes we don't. Uh, we're in smaller areas that don't. Um, and the better that parents can be open about communicating that in a non-judgmental way, I think uh, can only better the relationship with Swami in the future. Did you feel like you had expectations to fulfill of your parents? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I think <laughs> every young kid does. I still do. And it's still something you struggle with is that um, expectation that you have not only from your parents, from the Sai Center, from your other family, from, you know, everyone around you is that expectation is that are you fulfilling it? Are you doing what everyone wants you to do? Uh, are you being the best version you can be? And as young adults, I know I've heard this from a lot of young adults, is that everyone puts us up on a platform uh, and says that, oh, you're such good role models, you're such good role models, and you kind of want to remind them we're all human, we're all figuring out together, and we can only do that um, working together. It's, um, I think, kind of bringing it back to that. But trying to get away from that level of expectation and just understand that it's life, we're all going to slip and fall, but we have the foundation to be able to pick ourselves back up again. Would you like to share? Sure. So, Swami once guided me, every day, pray with your children and pray for your children. And I think the strongest prayer I had was that my children should develop a relationship of their own and that they should have Swami's experience for their own selves. And I'll share with you an, an episode that happened soon after I kind of started to have the prayer of Swami, you have to start reaching out to the children on, for yourself for, so that they can develop this. We had gone to the New Mexico retreat and I think my children were about nine and seven. And um, on our way back, my daughter said, I, and when I say said, it was many, many times, I want Wendy's. And so after about several times, my husband just kind of said, okay, close your eyes and say 21 ohms, and then we'll see. <laughs> so she closed her eyes and very sincerely said 21 ohms. And we went over a hill and there was a Wendy's. <laughs> and you know, this was the first time she had an experience where she had just asked for something and Swami had responded. And I think that was a very powerful moment in her life. And you know, Swami says a mother's prayer is very powerful. And I felt, she felt it was the answer to her prayer, but I felt it was the answer to my prayer that my child should have her own connection with Swami. So that was one thing. The second thing is that who you are as a devotee is what the children see. 
If they see you giving lip service to devotion to Swami, and you're not internalizing as much of Swami's teachings as you can, it is evident. So I think the best thing you can do for your children is to become the best devotee you can be. Imbibe and, and, uh, and what's the word for giving, uh, role model, whatever you are able to of Swami's teachings. And, and then take them to SSE classes and it was non-negotiable. In our house it was non-negotiable on Sunday mornings. And again, I'm going to give my daughter as an example. All through, I think, her teen years, every week or every other week, she would say, do I have to go to SSE? And she would say, yes. <laughs> she, I mean, she, I don't, she, I, you can't blame her for trying, but it was always, yes, you have to go. And what's interesting to me now is she has every intention of taking the kids to SSE. Because I think it's not until you look back on it that you really see the value of it. Um, and so, and I would agree with the open communication. And the way that that happened in our family was that, except for I think a year and a half, I worked part time. So in the years that they were growing up, I was a full time parent and a part time working person. In the years since they've grown, I've been a full time physician and, and teacher um, and a part-time parent. So that's how I've looked at it. But when I would bring them home from school, that 15 minute ride home is when all of the things that happened in the day would come out slowly. After that initial two sentences, how was your day? Good. And what did you learn? Nothing. After that, <laughs> everything else. Was, was real stuff, and including the conversation between the kids in the back seat that I was just privy to because I happened to be the chauffeur. And I was able to kind of put a sentence here or a suggestion there, or you know, you might want to consider looking at it this way. Without saying you have to or you should, I was able to do that, especially as they got older and in their teenage years. And one last thing I'd say is that I think kids need this parent at after school more during their teen years rather than less. So we often think that when you are old enough to feed yourself, dress yourself, and stay at home alone, then you don't need the parent home when you get home from school. And I just think. In my own experience, I think that's both as a child growing up and as a parent raising my children, I think that's not true. I think that's when you need the most because that's when it's not the physical development, it's the emotional, mental, conscience development. So, and I have a follow-up question for you too. How do you balance that being there for your teenage child with giving them the space they need? Because they do tend to be moody. <laughs> <laughs> so if you could open that up, follow the um, I think that if you accept moodiness, and the thing is, we have been given so much love from Swami that we have plenty left over to share whether a person is treating you the best way or not. So I think the way I think of it is you're kind of like a levy. You're a levy when the waters are kind of um, bashing. And you're there to kind of stand steady. So I think the less you take it personally and the less you actually react to the statement that's made and you respond more to the underlying feeling, I think that's what helped me give that space. Um, one of the things is sort of going off by yourself and 
thinking about it. And uh, I once was asked by a patient, at what age should you stop timeouts? Um, and so I actually learned this from a colleague of mine. And she said, you don't stop timeouts. You actually model timeouts. So when you are upset, you say, I need a timeout. And then timeout stops being a punishment and starts being a space where people can calm themselves down and they can transition from an externally imposed timeout to, I need a timeout and I'm gonna go in my room and think and calm myself down and then come back and join the family space. So I think that's the other way is that you actually model timeout as that space of moodiness. for all of you because you've all been teens and you've all had to go through exams. So how did you get yourself to SSC class when you had exams to take care of or you had schoolwork to do? This is non-negotiable. Um, <laughs> you go to SSC, um, you tie manage, you make your way around it, but you know, SSC was there. I don't think we would ever skip it because of an exam or because we were studying. And I think the same thing went for Friday Budget because we would always go It just, you kind of work everything else around it. And I think that that's translated to my um, young adult life as well as that, you know, you make time for what's important and, um, you know, going to budgets for an hour refreshes you and it gives you the energy to keep going and get more done because um, it centers you. And same with SSC is after SSC, I mean, you wake up early, you go to SSC, you're back. You have the whole day to do stuff. So it actually kind of gets your engine running quicker. So, um, but it's about time management, definitely. I'm just going to go back on the question that you had asked before because I just had some one little thing to share. For me, it was a little bit different because I grew up in India in very close proximity to Swami. So growing up, uh, there was a talk about uh, standards that you're held to. <laughs> I was held to the highest standards, not only by my parents, but there was Swami behind me all the time. And I remember sometimes when I was in my teenage years saying, go be omnipresent somewhere else. <laughs> Don't be in my space, you know, because he would know exactly what I was doing at all times. My parents didn't have that wonderful quality. But here was this person who came and stayed with us and I remember very clearly that I was into reading all sorts of novels when I was in my high school years and Swami would for some reason want to have dinner in my room on my desk. <laughs> so every time my mother served dinner or lunch, it would be in my room and I was like, can you not just eat at the dining table like everybody else? But there was a reason for this. He would come into the room and every time Swami came, all my novels, they were the deep shelves, bookshelves, the novels would be in the back and in front of those books, which I, could, I was reading, would be the Satya Sai speech. <laughs> which, which looked brand new. I mean, anybody would know I hadn't turned those pages, but they were brand new. And he would come into my room to eat and he would be waiting for my brother, mother to bring rice or whatever. And he would take out four books and look there and he said, Oh, these are the books you're reading now. <laughs> Looking at them now. So, I mean, that's exactly why I didn't want him to his omnipresence that much. So my standards were like too high and I, I mean, like any teenager growing up in any country, I resented that, honestly. But I loved him so much that, you know, because of the so much love that he pours, that when you said you want a carrot on an ice cream, you're going to choose the ice cream as healthy as the carrot might be or whatever the peer thing going on. So I loved them so much that when I raised my children here in the US, they didn't have that kind of physical proximity except when we went to India. And I too, like Samia, wanted them to have Swami for themselves, not the Swami that I told them all the time about. You know, Swami did this for me, Swami did that for me, and they're like, oh, okay, okay, whatever, you know. But they grew up loving him, they saw him, 
but the one thing that happened to them and if we have tremendous faith in him as a mother that we want our children to tread the right path he will respond it doesn't matter how Samia talked about the Wendy incident for me it was a little different because of the physical presence we had had a kind of in our center my children were about seven years old we went to Bangalore and went to Puttaparthi and Swami called us in for an interview and the children were sitting and they, they sang all night. They were, we were a small center at that time. So these two kids, seven years old, my twin sons, sang all night long because there were not that many singers. And during one of the bhajans, I believe, I didn't even remember that, my son had got up to go and drink orange juice when somebody was singing. And, and in another bhajan, they had missed a beat while singing. And when we were in the interview room, Swami said, good boys attended Akanda Bhajan, he said. And he said, yes, Swami, we sang, we sang, we sang. He said, yes, you sang, but you got up for orange juice when somebody was singing. And then he said, for Bola Bandari Baba, you missed the beat in the second speech. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that was it for them, you know, because they knew that Swami was with them all the time. And I did tell them that we are different, but we are unique. So if you stick with Sai Path, your friends may not be there with you, but you are a unique individual who has seen God. How many people? So um, for that same previous question, um, you know, I was thinking about this with my uh, teenage years, and they were probably weren't the best, but. Um, being the position I am as a young adult, and I interact with a lot of group four and younger young adults, and I've been kind of lucky, and one of my um, younger SSC um, kids came up to me and was like, Didi, sometimes I just get so angry. Like, what do I do? Like, when I, I don't want to talk to my parents, and I'm going through all of this stuff, and, you know, my suggestion to her was very much similar to what Sonia Auntie just said, was um, go take a time out and say, Mom, I need... 10 minutes, just let me cool down, and then, um, you know, I'll be ready to talk, but just give me 10 minutes, and not so much the story and what it was, but how important it is for young adults to be there for group three and four going through that. I think sometimes it's hard for parents and kids to understand it. I wish I had someone tell me that when I was going through that age, um, and for me, as a young adult, I want to make sure that young adults take that kind of role, obviously with parents' respect in mind, you know, you're close and comfortable with the kids to be able to say that, but, uh, you know, it sometimes helps to have that middle ground for someone who's been through that to um, kind of go to and say, how do you deal with this in a, in a proper way, in a spiritual way, in a side way, without getting angry and exhibiting behavior that's not good? Thank you, Yanka. Um, you know, as I was listening to you and I was looking at the audience, I was thinking there would be a lot of us that have not known Swami or been brought up in his fold. But as I was hearing you, I realized that once you get to know him, at whatever stage in your life, um, the standard is higher. And as women, we tend to... Uh, feel guilty for a lot of things that we do and don't do, um, especially as mothers. So how do you address someone that has the concern of, I don't follow everything that Swami says, how can I tell my children to? Anybody can go. Ikanti? <laughs> no, I mean, I think we have to... The communication part that Saumya was mentioning uh, with our children is most important. And as she said, I too did a part-time job while they were um, young. And, and the time to be there for them is very important uh, when they come home and they want to talk to you. So the communication part is the most important thing. But holding them to high standards, I felt, were equally important. Because we want to hold them to high standards. We want them to say that this is where we have to reach. This is our goal. Swami holds us to very high standards. He says, you're born as a human being. You live in this world. But your ultimate goal is to realize yourself. He holds us to very high standards. So, you know, we have to do that. 
but when we um, are going through that whole process, was it, did you say balance? What? Yeah. How do you not feel guilty about telling your children? No, we, we don't have to feel guilty about telling our children because more than anybody in the world, your children know your faults. They'll be waiting to say, oh, how come you told me to talk so little in my case and you're constantly on the phone with somebody, you know, and you tell me to be quiet. So, you know, the children know your fault, so trying to hide it is useless. So, it's better to tell them that I am also on this journey along with you. It's just that I have been on it a longer time <laughs> because of my faults and I've learned a few things along this journey that I'm trying to share with you so that you don't make the same mistakes that I made. Maybe you'll make new mistakes, but at least you have the advantage of not making the mistakes I made. So in fact, that was one of the things that Swami had told me. I get angry with you, but when I correct you, don't make the same mistake. Make a new mistake, I'll correct you again. <laughs> but don't make the same mistake. So I kind of told them that and I think we have to tell them that we are also full of faults. We are all on the same journey. But I've just been on it a little bit longer than you. And if you can find some good things that I have seen, I'm telling you, I'm sharing it with you. Try to use that to your advantage. Thank you. So I agree. I think we have to maintain as high standards as we can. And um, my answer whenever it was like, Oh, well, why do we have to do that? Or, it's my job. That was my standard line. This is my job. And I have to answer to Swami, and I have to do the job to the best of my ability. So that was my answer for having the high standard. Um, oh, and I would say the same thing, is I didn't expect them not to make a mistake. I expected them at every moment to try their best to maintain as high a standard as they could. And, and I had that same expectation for myself. And the thing is, if you always commit yourself to doing your best at that moment, your best changes. Mm -hmm. But you never have to look back and say, I didn't do my best. Because at that time it was your best. And so I think it's easier to kind of forgive yourself for mistakes you've made in the past because you didn't know better or because you didn't have the ability, the emotional strength or whatever it was. If you always commit to doing your best, I think that makes, I think that reduces Swami's teaching into one single thing. So that was what I expected. Thank you. A very common topic that comes up in questions that people have have to do with, you know, Swami always talks about gender separation. Um, and people have questions about dating. Should I date? Should I not? This is not India. I live here. So how do you apply Swami's dictum about dating and gender separation to life and culture here? Because I've noticed people either ignore it and say it doesn't work or they have their own idea about it uh, and get all confused. So what has been your approach to this? Have you been guided by Swami? Would you like to share? So, um, you know, I read the question I was like, oh yeah, I guess that's probably an issue. But when you grow up in this cycle, you know, Forget about it. You're used to sitting separately at budget and having certain things you do in the center time and certain things you don't and certain people you talk to and certain people you shouldn't you shouldn't associate too much, but just the right amount. I was lucky because our center was never too um, too conservative or too, you know, no one would ever be like, oh, don't be talking to side brothers right now. You know, we didn't have too many restrictions. Um, but we also all knew what was um, right, what was modest, what was appropriate. And I think that that's why um, that there wasn't. So I was fortunate. Um, I also grew up going to girls' school, so that gave me another layer of understanding of, of why maybe some of that separateness is there. Um, 
But I guess when it when you look at it, I just I think when it comes to parents and kids in this topic, because I think that's an important place where it comes through, especially for kids who grew up in kind of more traditional households. Being able to have that open, non-judgmental communication with your parents about what's going on and being able to talk about it is the best thing you can do, I think, for, for your kid as an adult, for them to be able to bring it to you. Um, if it is happening maybe within the center or dating, and you know, some things happen. This happens. We all have seen it in our centers. But the more openly you can communicate about it with your family, I think that's the starting point for this. I know there's no right or wrongs. So we're in the society and we're all trying to figure it out. But I guess from what I've seen is that open communication is the best platform for any of this. So, in this I have evolved. <laughs> when I was a teenager, I used to be outraged that Swami would say, don't talk to 50% of the population. <laughs> As if the remaining 50% was not enough to talk to. So, I, I really fought against that like, in, mentally. I mean, one of the things that, perhaps just my style, is to behave externally as I'm expected to while I figure it out in my head. And actually, I have found that that has been, even though there's a discordance in yourself for a while, I've trusted Swami to show me the why later. And so I didn't really behave outrageously, even though mentally I was still arguing with Swami. Um, now, though, I really understand that Swami's separation is not about morality. It's about development. And I actually tell this, not in the context of Swami, to my patients who are teenagers. And I say, this is a time of intense development of every single one of your talents. And what happens is, if you get into a relationship really early, you short-circuit the development of certain talents because of what that person might think about it. And I give the example of chess, mainly because most of my, um, most of the kids are not encouraged to do chess. Like most of the, in relationships, the, the, the boy may not be encouraging the girl to, to do chess. I choose that as an example. And I say, yeah, chess, the game. <laughs> so I say, suppose you were really good in chess um, and your boyfriend didn't appreciate that. You would automatically not develop that talent. Um, and so, and the interesting thing is the look that comes in their eyes at even as young as age 12 and 13 is, oh my God, I've already done that. And so, I really think that this is not just for um, Sai devotees, but I really think the broader community, the longer that people stay focused on their own development as individuals, both men and women, as individuals, they have far more of a whole person to bring to a relationship when it's time for the relationship. So, um, and there have been studies that have shown that girls do better in all girl classes. They don't, because otherwise what they do is they, they dump themselves down be in order to be acceptable to the class. And that is a well-known, that's actually been studied. So I think that Tommy put it in the context of this is what you should do and he didn't explain it and I didn't understand it at that time, but this is how I have understood it since. And I, this is how I would explain it to anyone going through that stage now. Um, I, that's why I'm kind of laughing, because I'm sitting here thinking, did I live on Mars when I was a teenager or something? Because my experience was so completely different from these two young ladies here. Because Swami got me married to my husband, I only came to his know his name after Swami 
had fixed the marriage, the date and everything. When we left the interview room and we came out, I asked my mother, what is the guy's name? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm coming from that background. But, uh, you know, so that was my thing. I, Swami said, this is the person, marry him and I married him. I didn't even his, know his name, that Swami said. It. But I came to this country and I raised my children here, which is the important topic that we are talking about now. And, you know, we had high standards like we talked before, but because of all these things that I saw and heard from my peers who were also raising children, I was convinced even before my children were seven and a half years old that they were going to bring 20 girls home and they wanted to, they would want to marry all of them. I had this terrified, petrified feeling in my heart. So every time I went to Puttaparthi, I would remind Swami, Swami, I'm living in America. I'm living in a... He says, yes, I know you, I sent you there. I, I mean, I didn't want to say, what about my children? And then actually, Swami gave a beautiful explanation, which he never thought of giving me when I was a teenager. I was quite upset about that. But, <laughs> but he did to my children in this culture and in this country and it is exactly what Saumya put it beautifully. He said that when you are a student, when you can realize your full potential of what you can become as an adult, if you are going to invest those emotions on things like relationships and everything, you do not have the maturity to handle it if, you do, if it doesn't work out. You're going to be a basket case. And Swami did one little drama in the room. And he said, you'll be saying, Sairam, Sairam, this girl doesn't like me, Sairam, Sairam, this girl. <laughs> and I cannot make the girl like a fool like you. <laughs> because, because, you don't earn your own money. You don't have a car. You cannot even drive yet properly without getting parking tickets and red light, running red lights. How can I make a poor girl like a fool like you? So your job is to develop and realize your full potential. Become a man. Learn to become a responsible citizen of the world. A good human being who can take on the responsibility of another human being. That's what a relationship and a marriage is. When you're ready for that, Swami will show you the right person. So that is it. Swami, I was listening to you and I was thinking, Swami is so loving and kind when it comes to women and girls. I can speak for it firsthand. Like, you read Satya Sai speaks and you think, oh my, like you're so out of touch, you're... <laughs> what you say goes over my head. But in moments like this is where he shows his absolute love and he feels, he feels our pain as women, he does. And um, gives tips accordingly. So, a lot of, um, so to have the faith, to have the faith that things will happen. It's not like he doesn't want you to. So can you talk to that dating multiple people? We <laughs> talked about it a bunch. <laughs> right? Yes. Ah. Yes. Swami actually, even that, he said to them, he said, you know, when you're growing up and through your life, you have to keep a single chair in your heart. I don't sit on a double sofa. I sit on a single sofa. So while you're growing up and you're developing your faith and you want to lead a spiritual life with Swami as your core, then that has to be your occupation first. And if you develop that tremendous love and faith for Swami, He will show the right person for you at the right time. There is a time involved. And He knows and if we have that faith when that uh, time comes. And as far as he said, you know, he did address this actually. And I just want to make the point that because my children grew up here, though they knew Telugu and Kannada, they could understand very well. This particular advice that he gave about dating and marriage, he spoke to them completely in English. 
And at the end of the interview, he said, I spoke to you in English so that I don't want you to come back and say, I didn't understand what's going on. <laughs> so he is a master psychologist. You know, he, so as far as multiple, he said it is not good because you are going to get more and more confused. You like some qualities in this girl, you like something else in that girl, you like something. There is never going to be a girl who will meet your dream 100%. So he said the quality that you have to develop is that of adjustment and compromise. And for that, one person that Swami sends you will be more than enough. You need your whole life to learn about one person. How will you learn about 20 people? <laughs> In my case, he it would have been 40. <laughs> I wanted to add something because after we spoke yesterday on this topic, the only thing I could think of was, you know, growing up, it's always no date, no explanation, no, I mean, nothing else. And I don't know how many young adults have experienced that too. But hearing stories like this and understanding the reasoning behind it helps so much. So the better parents, moms, you know, you have a better emotional connection to be able to explain that to your kids is so important. I think that just saying no, if you tell someone no, they're going to want to do it anyway. But <laughs> having a conversation like this is very, very important. And the only thing I would say is, have the faith that Swami sends the person. Whether they send it to your parents or they send it to you, Swami is in charge of all of this. So I, I think, again, having that foundation of faith that your life is directed by Him is really important, both for the parents and for the children. Thank you. Um, I have two questions here. One is, um, and by the way, I've been integrating your questions as we've gone along. Um, Here's one where they say that people think that uh, Swami does not provide enough opportunities for women and they cite the example of colleges where the courses are lesser. Um, so why are there less choices for women um, than for men? And why does he not give enough chances for women? Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, generally, in his institutions, in life, like you always see the boys and the men around him and not women. I think it, it is not lesser or more, it is different. He is developing his women in a different way. And I kind of think of it as up and I was talking about the preciousness of what's in a bag. Um, the preciousness is not out visible. Um, I think those things are kept close. And I feel like that's how Swami develops his women. Um, he, it's, it's, a very, it's just a different kind of development. And I think, well, that's, I'm just going to stop there. I just think it's different. It's different. It's not less. No, it's not less. Thank you. Actually, I'll tell you what Swami said. <laughs> because this was a question that I grew up with. You know, I grew up in India. Till the age of 13, I went everywhere with Swami in the car. Wherever he went, he would take me. And suddenly, 13, it stopped. Only my brother drove the car for Swami. He would even get the choice of which car to drive for Swami. And I would have this long face all the time. But I never had the courage to ask him anything when I was young. But it was much later when I was a mother and I had two sons and we were in there. And my sons, I used to tell them how that physical interaction of going everywhere with Swami stopped for me. My sons were, oh, good thing we are boys then and all that. So when we were in the interview room, you know, I told Swami finally after so many years, I think it was in the back of my brain. I said, Swami, you stopped me from going with you everywhere after that age of 13. Now at least Arun and Varun, my sons, they can enjoy your physical presence for a long time because all the college boys are always behind you here. And Swami very sweetly said, the boys need me more than <laughs> 
The boys need me more. Their brains are going like monkeys from one branch to the other. One brother. Girls are dignified and mature. So that answer he kind of finished with me. But the yeah. and mature. But then he also added that women are judged more, unfortunately, in every society by the character, by their character. So you must be careful not to get remarks. That is why even Swami is careful. And he told me actually when you go and give your talks, when people want to take your photo, when some office bearers or all men call their wives and together take a photo. Because they will say, Gita Ram has five husbands. <laughs> so, he said, remarks will affect your life. People will talk behind you. So, women are always held to the highest level of purity. So, to reach that purity, you have to follow some worldly norms. Thank you. Your faith, you have so much faith in Swami. Has it been challenged at any point of time in your life? Challenged. Yes, so my faith was challenged when, um, when our family experienced something that sort of separated our family briefly. Um, and what helped me through that is that my husband had absolutely rock solid faith. And I'm sure that Swami got me through that, got me married to him, in order for our family to weather that, that shake, unshakable faith, um, to weather that shaking time, shaking time. And um, what I've noticed is that faith itself is a gift from Swami. And I think our first prayer should be, Swami, please make sure I always have faith in you. Because that is not to be taken for granted at all. So. No, I think my answer to that is no. But one very beautiful sentence that Swami told my sons when they were entering college was, have faith in Swami and have confidence in your faith. Um, so, both of you are, you are a grandmother, and you both are mothers-in-law. Uh, what teaching of Swami do you find relevant today as you take on this new role in your life? How do you practice it? Um, I don't think I practice it any differently than how I treat my adult children. I mean, it's, again, back to basic principles. Be the best that you can at every moment. And fortunately for me, Swami has made it really easy. I mean, they're lovely people, so <laughs> so I I don't think there's any difference in being an in-law than being a mother, except that you don't feel responsible for the the development of the character and with your own adult children. You can make statements of, you might consider it this way, or I might do it this way. But even for your own adult children, you're no longer responsible for their behavior and their connection with Swami. That is theirs. And I think that's how I, I feel towards my son-in-law. Um, for me, uh, you know, I was just um, absolutely excited to have two girls in the family, having had sons for whom you have to shop for boring clothes, you know. <laughs> so I was very excited to have two girls in the family. And like Saumya said, um, for me too, you know, I, but I came from a little bit of a different background due to the way I was raised and the way I interacted with my own in-laws. Maybe to some extent, you know, there is always a sense of expectation uh, from the girls and I would constantly remember and remind myself 
that they are adults now and they have to lead their independent lives. And as she said that I might make a suggestion and I had to learn to say it once and then sort of take a back step and say they will make their decisions as grown-ups. But it was a little bit different for me when I became a grandmother. I have four grandchildren and I raise my children. I, uh, my whole educational background is in early childhood and I always felt I knew a lot about children. And you very soon come to know you don't. <laughs> so I um, had to learn to actually put a little bit of distance between me constantly trying to tell my sons as well as my daughters-in-law what they should be doing with their children. Their children are only two and five, they're still very young. But I found myself saying, oh, why don't you feed them this way? Or maybe they eat better if you give them that. It was all just very mundane stuff. And my husband, who's very angry, would say, well, you know, it's their children, you realize that, right? They're just your grandchildren. And he would remind me of that. And I had to kind of learn that a little bit, and I think I'm still in the process, to learn to respect the motherhood of my daughters-in-law. They are also mothers. They are also going through. And I have to learn to respect that. They are mothers. Why am I thinking I am so great just because I am their grandmother? You know, they are also mothers. They have the best interest of their children. So, I am still learning and I keep telling my daughters-in-law that if I overstep, let me know and I will back off. But I'm still learning because that, that's something, you know, it's a grandchild and you think you want to do this, that or the other and they'll say, Mommy, no chips before dinner, please. <laughs> and you know, the grandchildren know chips, 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 chips before. So I'm learning to respect their motherhood. It's such a beautiful journey, right? As women, you just grow and you keep growing and you evolve and evolve and it never ends. Um, so I'm assuming as you were talking, you are a mother-in-law. Um, your sons have mothers-in-law, your daughter has mothers-in-law. So just like every stage in life, as a young adult too, how do you deal with negative slash just peer pressure? I think um, an important part of that is that negative peer pressure is always going to be around you. Negativity, things coming at you. The best thing you can do for yourself early in life is learn to listen to your inner voice. Learn to figure out a way to hear it, that Swami within you, and that offers you the guidance in whatever you do. And I don't know how you develop that. You know, there's could be through bhajans, it could be through meditation, it could be through yoga. Find what it is that allows you to start listening for it and hear it more and more. And that's the only thing that's going to guide you through. Um, and give you the answers you need in the situations. Things sometimes aren't so black and white, um, and that inner voice is the only thing that can help you through it. So I was very susceptible to peer pressure. And um, so Swami had to make the drastic move, and I'm sure there were multiple other reasons, but. Swami made the drastic move of actually asking me to leave medical school about six months before I graduated. And in retrospect, one of the things was that he wanted me to... It wasn't that they were bad. It was just that they... I was drifting, as I had said earlier, and when you remove yourself from the situation, you can look at it with clarity, but the other thing was you learn to walk alone. And it is the courage to walk alone that you develop by walking alone. Mm. So I think if you think of it as, oh, I can't do this, and you just think of it as their negative, it, you think you react to it differently. But when you think, you know, this is a situation where Swami wants me to develop some courage, wants me to develop a spine, then you think of it differently and you think of it as your workout. And I think that in retrospect, that learning, that period of time which was so hard, and I walked alone for, and our families were in, uh, were, 
They, our extended family thought my parents were crazy for supporting me in doing this. But, um, and then Swami said, go back and finish. But like, that was the easiest thing to do. <laughs> um, but I think he taught me in that experience, and I don't recommend it for any of you. Um, don't let Swami get to the point where he has to do something drastic. But I think, take every opportunity to develop that courage of walking alone. It, and the times when you do it when it's small, it actually develops your strength, and he won't have to give you big ones to develop the strength. One is uh, very similar to what she's saying. When my sons, I say it from their point of view, uh, when my sons were about to enter a college, Swami gave some really beautiful advice to them and I thought it may be useful to share because I've seen so many youngsters here. And this was the question that my sons asked Swami. Swami, we are going to go to college. We are different. And mom keeps saying we are unique, but we are different. She doesn't understand that. <laughs> so, how are we going to deal with the kind of pressure that we are going to face in college? And Swami very sweetly sort of patted them both on their cheeks and he said, this is for all my Sai children, he said. It was not only for my son. He said in Telugu, Sai ku yepulu yes, yes, yes. For Swami, it's always yes, yes, yes. Actually meaning the letter S, 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 you know. But he made up, he had a pun on those words. He said, when you are a student, it is an S. When you're a student, study, that's an S. When you're very tired of studying, go and play sports, that's an S. When you're tired of sports, go and sing, that's an S. Sing meaning anything else that gives you food for the soul, he said. So not if you can't sing, don't sing and make the whole dorm like a complain on you. But you know, some activity that is food for your soul. So when you do that, you're never alone. Swami is always with you saying yes, yes, yes to the S's in your life. So I'll be there with you and much later, a couple of times when we went later, he would tell them when they used to go and play basketball by themselves on a Saturday evening when there was nobody in the dorm, everybody had gone clubbing, he would tell them how many scores they had scored in the basketball court. So that was one experience. But the other peer pressure you were started out asking, as a mother-in-law, what is the pressure? Believe me, Bollywood has made it very <laughs> difficult. Because you have to live down this image of this mother-in-law who's going to do something really mean and nasty to you. So I found myself telling my daughters-in-law almost, don't be scared of me, I'm not going to do anything to you. <laughs> because I just love them to death and they were wonderful, they're wonderful girls. But it is, I mean, we get kind of so many different inputs from the society around you, we just have to remember to be ourselves. I know there is nothing about me that they should be scared of. If I know that, and if I love them, then my relationship with my daughters-in-law should be really beautiful. I have another question about balancing home life, work, and Sai Center. We all have, we all love Sai, and we show up at the center every week and we think we need to take on a lot of responsibilities. So how do you balance your work life, home life, and your side center life? It's, it's tricky. Um, coming from a city with a very small size which you end up wearing a lot of hats and playing a lot of roles and you know there's no real option for not showing up. Um, and so that's a priority. Work is demanding and you know there's weeks where you're working 50, 60 hours a week and wondering, okay, how am I gonna have time for all of my side commitments? And then there's family situations and weddings and things going on and you're finding yourself running all over the place. Um, you know, making that time to have not just the Sai Center connection with Swami, but your one on one connection with Swami in between all of that, meditate, pray. Make time every day for that moment 
and somehow things speed up. Like there's magically more time in the day, um, and I don't know how it works. It's Swami's Leela. He he gives you the time where you need it. Sometimes something might fall away, um, and when I find those moments, I say thank you, Swami, for clearing that off my schedule. You know, he's he's watching out for you. He never gives you more than you can handle. Um, but be ready for him. Um, he, he needs you to do something too. Um, I think I've felt that I I need a center like I need lunch. It it nourishes me and it actually enables me to do more in my week. Um, as far as responsibilities go, if Swami has given you experiences and skills and faith, then I think he has. I have a responsibility to use them in the way that he wants. So if he doesn't give me the time, then I wouldn't do it. But he always clears. He's my admin assistant, for those of you who heard that. I mean, he basically uh, fixes my calendar and he gives me space to do all of the things that he feels that I need to do. But I have to say that when I get something cleared, I tell my colleagues, it's like finding $20 in my pocket that I didn't know I had. It's like an extra 30 minutes. <laughs> So I think uh, Swami um, really has said that we have to fix our priorities. If we are working, Swami says work is worship, duty is God. You have to do your work and whatever that duty is fully to the best of your, uh, your abilities. Your family will take on the next responsibility. You have to be there for your family. You know, he says charity begins at home. And I remember once he really scolded a couple of seva than people in Vrindavan, older ladies who had come to wash the dishes in the super specialty hospital. They said, your husband is unwell. You have left all your dishes in the sink for him to wash. And you're here coming and washing my dishes in the, in the hospital. That should not be your priority. So we have to pick and choose our priorities. So first we have to do the ones that are most important for our being your family and thing. And Swami's work will automatically come to you when the time is right. If that particular time is not right, it will not come to you. When the time is right, you choose your work and do it accordingly. Thank you. You know, um, just listening to you all, um, it's so clear and I'm sure you'll agree with me that no matter where we come from and how we grew up, what cultural circumstances brought us to where we are today. The fact that we know Swami, we know his teachings, puts us in a place where we have something to aspire for. And we can reach that aspiration only with faith. And no matter what our problems are, no matter where we come from, these problems seem to be so common. And I was looking at you as they were talking, everybody would have been able to relate to something or the other. So problems take different forms, but they remain the same. They take different cultural contexts, but they remain the same. Even though Gita Auntie grew up right under Swami, so she had the exact same problems as you and I. She didn't want him to be watching her. She's like, go find somebody else. And we find the same thing happening today with us. Or, you know, or Samya saying, why did I get to know you now? Like, why could I have known you later? Because life would have been a little easier. Like, I wouldn't have had to achieve, you know, reach the bar that you set for us. And this is something, is the process of evolution. We grow, but the constant person that's always going to be with us, whether we like it or not, is going to be Swami. There's no change in that. He's watching, he's listening, and he's by us. He says, don't walk in front of me, I'm not going to follow you. He says, don't walk behind me, I'm not going to turn and look to see if you're there. He says, walk beside me. So we take Swami with us in whatever roles we play, in whatever days we may have. We'll get over our, what he calls bumps and jumps. And 
will be able to wear all those hats. Now that you put all those hats on, you take all those hats off. And we all look alike. We're human beings connecting to the divine. That's all it is. So with that said, I just want to end with Swami's words and a letter he wrote to all of us. Um, on the screen, you should be able to see his original letter and handwriting. Yeah. Dear children, life is so complicated. I can see that all of you are going through various stages. The awakenings are there. Remember something. Enjoy every single second, yet know your priorities. You can do everything in life. With good time management and love, you can achieve great feats. Make the most of your time. Do the things you want, but also share the worlds of your friends, brothers, and sisters. There is no such thing as my or your world. Know how each of you are and try to be one with each other. I am your guru, father and protector. I love you and will guide you. Remember that life is like a highway. There are all kinds of signs and indications that show you the ways. Many roads can lead to the same destination but when the roads cross, this is where the minds and the worlds meet. Life is like the slopes of a mountain. You always climb up, but sometimes you may fall. But always remember that you have got the power to stand up on your feet again. God's guidance towards your destination. Love and protection, sigh.